First speaker is Carlo Sparatari. He's speaking on multi-resource theories and the first law. Thanks a lot. Um, and let me thank you um, for inviting me here because um, it's a really nice uh, conference and I'm having a great time, so thank you. Um, so the work I'm going to present um, is in collaboration with uh, Lydia Dorio from ETH, um, with uh, Carlo Maria Scandalo from Oxford, uh, with Philip Feist uh, from Caltech, and with uh, Jonathan Hoppenheim, my advisor in, uh, in UCL. Um, and probably the first thing I should say about this work is that um, although it's inspired by uh, work on thermodynamics, uh, and although a lot of examples I will present here uh, are concern thermodynamics, um, uh, this work is not just about thermodynamics. Um, essentially what we do is to take some ideas from the resource theory of thermodynamics, um, a specific resource theory that I will introduce later, um, and try to extend them uh, finding a framework for a general resource theory, in particular a framework for a situation where you want to describe tasks where um, instead of having a single kind of resource, you have multiple ones. Um, and within this framework, what we do is um, to study a, a particular relation um, that is linked to the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and I will introduce later this relation, but just let me say that um, we find that is uh, very well, not very well, but um, is very much related to interconversion of resources. Meaning if you have two resources and uh, you have a lot of one resource, you want to get another one, uh, what do you need in order to uh, pay a bit of this resource and gain a bit of this other resource? Um, so now I'm, I'm going to present this framework and talk about this, but let me give you some motivation why we are interested in this. Um, and well, I think you, you all know that um, resource theory are uh, a great tool uh, because they apply to many different scenarios and uh, really describe different situations. Um, nevertheless, as I said, mm, they usually um, single out a one resource, uh, which is the important resource you, you need to uh, quantify. But in physics, uh, we have tasks that require you to use more than one resource. And I'm giving here some example. And the first one is quantum computation. Um, for, ex for instance, in a quantum computation, you want your initial qubit uh, to, be, to be as pure as possible, uh, but also you want your, um, your gate to create coherence over the computational basis, say. And you can see purity and coherence as, of course, two different resources that are both necessary in order to achieve your quantum computation. Um, likewise, um, you all know that um, there is a resource theory for thermodynamics and uh, it's a single resource theory, um, and that's great. Um, I, I want just to say that um, that's not the only way you can look at thermodynamics. You can actually think of it as a, re a resource theory with multiple resources. Uh, where, for instance, in order to perform a transformation, uh, you want to provide uh, to your system both work and heat, or uh, in alternative, you can think of providing energy and entropy, okay? Two different resources. And from there, you can also move to uh, thermodynamics with many conserved quantities, which is actually a, um, a line of research that um, is quite uh, interesting at the moment. Also for uh, conserved quantities that do not commute one with the other. Um, the second reason why we were interested in this work uh, is, has more to do with, uh, with this first and low relation that, uh, that we want to, to obtain, and is the fact that in resource theory, um, we have that we can find relation which in flavor are very much related to uh, the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, for example, for any resource theory, we have um, that we can define second laws. Um, so the second law, I'll state it, I mean, everyone already stated it, but um, I state the one uh, concerning entropy. If you have an isolated system, then as time goes on, uh, you expect your entropy uh, never to uh, decrease. So likewise, in resource theory, what you have is that there exists 
function, which are called monotone, uh, that whenever you apply your allowed operation over your system, this value of this monotone will always, um, will never increase under this operation. And so for us was a question of, um, can we also find a, a first law for generic resource theory? And with the first law, what I'm thinking here is um, to link the change in the internal property of, uh, of your system, like the change in internal energy of your system, um, linked to uh, the amount of resources that you are exchanging during a transformation. Um, so we want to find something like that for general resource theory where instead of having, say, a certain amount of heat absorbed from the environment and a certain amount of work performed on the environment, you have other kind of uh, resources, whatever you want. Um, so the idea for this talk is the following. I will introduce um, single resource theories because we need a bit of uh, common notation, let's say, for them moving to multi-resource theory case. And uh, I will just uh, chat a bit about this second law, what are the monotones, and I provide an example which is resource theory uh, of thermodynamics uh, with thermal operation. I then move to multi-resource theories, to this um, uh, framework we have. Uh, I'll give you another example which is thermodynamics as a multi-resource theory. And there we study a bit um, reversibility and how to quantify resources in, uh, in this framework. Then I will move to interconversion relation, how can trade thing, and from there we reach uh, a first law. Uh, if we have time, I'll go through these uh, thermodynamics with many conserved quantity as an example of, uh, of the first law, but in any case, I hope I put enough example here and there that uh, it, will it will be clear in any case, we'll see. Okay, um, that's it. Let, let's start with the single resource theory. So what are those? I would say that they are a set of tools. Um, they are a set of tools that allow you to describe the perspective of an agent um, um, who want to act over a system to transform its state while being constrained in uh, the kind of operation she can perform over this system. So think of Alice in her lab um, and she wanted to modify the state of an atom, and in her lab, for some reason, she has access uh, to a hammer, but not to a screwdriver. Um, so given this set of uh, constraints, what can she do over the system? Which state transformation can she perform? Um, and the nice thing of this formalism is that, uh, naturally, it may arise uh, a classification of states. And let's say that the most broad is probably the one between a resourceful state and free state. I would say that a resourceful state is a state that uh, if my system is initially in, uh, in such a state, then with the allowed operation I can move within the state space and explore many different uh, other states. Whereas a free state is a state that no matter where you start from, you can always go in such a state, and once you reach this state, you're not going to move outside this uh, set of free states. So let's say they're not really interesting because once you go there with the allowed operation, you don't get out anymore. You don't get to explore the state space, let's say. Um, in a more mathematical way, we are considering a um, quantum system. So the system is described by Hilbert space. The, spa the um, state space is the set of density operator over this um, state space. And then we have the allowed operation that are quantum channels. Um, and of course, they are not all the quantum channel, they are constrained, uh, is, is a subset. And the constraint can be um, either enforced by some kind of law of nature or by some technological restriction. Uh, and the example here are, for example, um, thermodynamics. Uh, given an isolated system, um, you cannot uh, modify the energy of this thing. So, Whatever Alice does with their, her operation, uh, she will have to uh, preserve the energy of the system, and this is enforced by a law of nature. Whereas in entanglement theory, we know that um, it's expensive to send quantum state through a line, and therefore um, the Alice and Bob can only um, perform local operation and classical communication. And this, I would say, is a technological restriction more than a law of nature. Finally, given your state space and your allowed operation, um, 
you can find what the free state are, meaning all the states that I can prepare no matter what is my initial state of a system. And the property which I think is quite important is that uh, this set is invariant under the set of operation. Um, so if I apply my, uh, any allowed operation, I will remain in this set. We'll see that in multiple resource theory, um, there is a difference between something being invariant and something being free. Uh, you can have many invariant set, uh, and you can have that no free state is available. Um, now I'll chat a bit about the second law, meaning this presence of monotone. Those are function from the state space to the real number such that if I apply my allowed operation, I will decrease the value, or at least I will never increase the value of, uh, uh, of these functions. There are multiple ones. I think Rob introduced a lot of them. Um, I'm just giving an example here is the relative entropy, or at least the monotony is called relative entropy distance from the set of free state. Um, you use the relative entropy. And uh, for any resource theory, uh, those set of free state is this f, whatever it is. You can build a monotone by uh, computing the relative entropy distance between your, your state, you want to measure this, uh, this quantity, and, um, and another state, sigma, which is within the free set. Then you optimize over the free set, and you get a monotone. This is a way of, uh, of getting a monotone for any resource theory you give me. And this is kind of a technical uh, thing that I need because later I will talk about like one of the property as this uh, kind of regularization, so I introduce it, but it's not really interesting, I think, which is the regularization of a monotone. If you give me a monotone, then you can regularize by computing its value over n copies of a state, dividing by n the number of copies, and sending everything to infinity. If the limit is... Um, is finite and well defined, then you can regularize this monot. Now I would um, I would give you an example, um, which is thermodynamics, the resource theory of thermodynamics with a thermal operation. So the setting is uh, is the following: we have uh, our experimentalist and. Um, um, she has a system she wants to modify, and she also has access to an infinite thermal bath at a given temperature. Um, and then the allowed operations she has are these three fundamental ones. Firstly, she can take any ancillary system from this thermal bath and put it in contact with my uh, main system. Um, thermal state just to remind you, is a Gibbs state uh, with uh, any given Hamiltonian you want, actually, for this ancillary system. Uh, the temperature uh, is given, like beta is the inverse temperature. Temperature is defined the reservoir you're considering. And Z is the partition function, the normalization of this thing. Um, once she takes the system and take whatever ancillary she wants, then she can act over this thing using um, reversible operations, so unitary operation that preserve the energy. The idea is that once you tensor this thing, like that's all you have is an isolated system, act reversibly and preserve the energy. And finally, she can forget about part of, um, of this global system. She can forget about the buff. She can forget about the system. She can forget uh, everything if, uh, if she wants. Uh, although in the next slide, I will focus on the case in which she forget about the buff. Because it's easier, I go just from my state space to the same state space. I don't change the Hamiltonian. Is, is a bit easier. Um, and so that in that situation, the most general thermal operation is of this form, which you obtain by combining this free operation. Uh, so she can add a thermal state, she act with a unitary operation with preserve the energy, and she trace the bath, or the ancillary system, if you want. Um, if you take this operation, and you check what's what's a free state for this thing, then it turns out that the free state is uh, uh, the thermal state at the same temperature of the reservoir uh, with, um, Hamiltonian, with, with the Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, and when you take this state, it's also easy to show that um, this thing uh, is a fixed point under the class of allowed operation. Okay? So again, it's invariant, let's say. Uh, finally, I just introduced an example of a monoton, okay? An example of a monoton for this uh, uh, 
for this resource theory, again, take this uh, relative entropy distance. Um, now the set of free state is just this thermal state. Uh, and what you get is that this monotone is actually proportional to the Elmos free energy uh, of the state you're, uh, you're considering, where the Elmos free energy is given by the average energy of, uh, of your state minus the temperature of your thermal reservoir times the von Neumann entropy of your state. Okay? This is an example of a monotone for this uh, resource theory, which is particularly important when you consider asymptotic um, transformation. So you are working in the many copy limit because this became the unique monotone to quantify your resources. Okay, I would now move to uh, multi resource theory, in the framework, and chat a bit about reversibility. Um, so, what's the idea here? Um, Say that you have a task and, um, or a model or something where you have multiple constraint and uh, multiple conservation law. Um, in order to build a multi-resource theory, what you do is to uh, introduce many single resource theory, each one for the different conservation law and um, uh, constraint you have. Say that you have M of these, so you build M single resource theory. Each of them come with their set of free state and their allowed operation. And then you build your multi-resource theory uh, by defining the set of allowed operation as the intersection between all the class of allowed operation of the sing different single resource theories. In this way, you get that um, all the monotone of all the different single resource theory are now monotone for your uh, resource theory. That's easy to, to see. And also, all the free set that you had of the different single resource theory are now invariant set for your uh, multi-resource theory. But they don't need to be free. Um, and I show this through an example, which is thermodynamics as a multi-resource theory. So here we are considering, like again, the experimentalist as an isolated system. Um, being isolated, she used uh, energy preserving operation. Um, and also, uh, she's acting according to quantum mechanics, so she's using uh, reversible transformation. Um, notice that this, at, at the first sight, might seem like a restriction uh, compared to like, the framework of thermal operation, uh, but I'm not telling you what, um, what this isolated system is. For example, it could be quite big and uh, being divided into partition. One is the main system of interest, and the rest is uh, a, a huge thermal bath. And then you obtain back uh, the resource here of thermal operation. But maybe you can have that uh, this thermal bath is finite dimensional, so you can study how, what's the back reaction between, during the interaction, or it might be correlated with your system. So it, it gives you a bit of uh, room to play around uh, with what's going on. And so how do you build this, uh, this resource theory? Uh, a way of doing it is to consider these two uh, resource theories. The resource theory of purity, those allowed operations are uh, unital maps. They map the identity into the identity. Uh, and the free state is the maximum mixed state. Um, the second resource theory you can consider is a resource theory of energy. Uh, the allowed operations are average energy not increasing maps. Um, and you find that in this situation, the free state is the ground state of your Hamiltonian, provided that, uh, which is pure, provided that uh, your Hamiltonian is not degenerate. So two free state uh, for the two, one free state for each uh, resource theory, let's say. Um, if you take the intersection of the maps, what you find is that um, these two points are now invariant, uh, invariant set or fixed point, but um, they're not free anymore because if you give the um, ground state um, for the resource theory of purity, that's a resource. And likewise, the maximum mixed state will have some energy inside, and so it will be a resource for, for the energy case. You can study um, monotons, uh, or like I can introduce some monoton for this resource theory, and again, I go to the case of uh, relative entropy for the resource theory of purity. This is a distance from the maximum mixed state, and you find out that this is minus uh, the von Neumann entropy. Um, and likewise, for the resource theory of energy, well, um, it would be a bit difficult to introduce, <laughs> to use the relative entropy distance from the ground state uh, because the relative entropy would be ill-defined. Um, 
And so we can just focus on the average energy that is a, a valid monotone in this situation. Although you can also reach this same thing using a specific limit considering the relative entropy distance. So if you take a thermal state, uh, like if you take the distance from a thermal state um, and you send beta to infinity, then uh, you get that whatever expression you, you add is the, um, the average energy. So that's a way of getting the average energy from uh, relative entropy distance. And it's interesting to notice that um, these two quantities are actually the one that compose the Helmholtz free energy. Um, so that actually, whenever you take a temperature which is uh, positive, or at least non-negative, um, you get that uh, this linear combination that make up a, a free energy is actually monotone for, uh, for this resource theory. And for any temperature you, can, you, you want, it's not just one temperature, because here we don't have a thermal path. Um, so they are all, they are parameter, they are not real temperature, let's say. Um, OK, this is what I wanted to say about this example. Um, I would now move to quantifying resources and uh, defining a bit what reversible is in, uh, in this framework. And I give you this, uh, this definition, which is a bit hand-waving, but hopefully we define it a bit better as we go through. So what I mean for a reversible theory? For me, it's, um, it's a theory where if I do a cyclic transformation, I don't lose any of my resources. So I start from rho. I perform a forward process. Uh, this process will need me to use some kind of resources, which I call delta omega f. And there are multiple ones, so I index them with the i. And I reach sigma. Then I can also do a reverse process mapping me from sigma to rho, it will use again uh, some kind of resource, or at least it will exchange some resources. The theory is reversible if uh, the amount of resources exchanged in the forward process is equal to the amount of resources exchanged in the backward process. So we never, um, we never lose resource when we do a cyclic transformation. We are always, always safe under that point of view. Although here, I mean, I'm saying that it's not really clear what I'm saying here is because uh, what are the resources I'm talking about, and how do we quantify them? So in order to do this, I need to introduce a property uh, that some resource theory, multi-resource theory can satisfy, some other cannot. So it, it depends. Uh, and this property is this asymptotic equivalence property. From now on, I'm considering just a, a multi-resource theory composed by two single resource theory, because it's easier uh, to present it, uh, so that the two resource theory will be R1 and R2. Uh, set of free state is F1 and F2, uh, allowed operation A1 and A2, and two specific monotone M1 and M2. The multi-resource theory, again, how do you build it, is uh, given by the allowed operation A3, which are intersection between the allowed operation of the two single resource theory. And then I say that uh, my uh, multi-resource theory satisfies asymptotic equivalence if whenever you have two state rho and sigma, such that the value of the regularized version of the first monotone over these two states is the same, and also the value of the second monotone, or the regularization of the second monotone, is the same for these other two. When this is the case, then there exists an allowed operation that will map n copies of, uh, of rho into n copies of sigma, where sigma is tending to infinity. Um, now, this definition I'm making it simple. Uh, here, you probably would need some, uh, some additional thing like uh, sublinear ancilla and, uh, and things like that. But just for the sake of the uh, explanation here, let's just say easy like this. Um, so you might ask exactly what this thing means. Um, and the idea is the following. Well, you have that within your state space, you can find um, states which have well, uh, the same value of these two monotone, and whenever you find this state, you can find an, uh, an operation to map from this state to the other, and vice versa, reversibly. You never lose anything because the monotone remains the same. Okay. Uh, and the first thing you can do with this uh, with this thing is, for instance, to represent the whole state space uh, in a diagram here, two dimensional, because I have two resources. Um, the first resource is on the x-axis, and the second resource is on the y-axis. Um, each point here is an equivalence class of state, labeled by this, the value of these two monotons. Um, and this green blob here is my state space. Okay? 
Um, this is an example of a resource theory like the resource theory of, multi, um, uh, of thermodynamics uh, where the two free state you started from, the one of the two uh, resource theory, uh, initial resource theory, are uh, disjoint. Um, and so they are invariant state, but they are uh, invariant, these two things, uh, but there are no free state. Yes? Mm. If you apply your allowed operation, um, this set is, uh, is conserved. Like uh, you map state into state in this set. Yes, it's closed. Better. Um, and there are no free state because actually, in order to have a free state, what you would need would be a state in this uh, in this point here. I am. Um, I don't know if it's if this is clear. Uh, I, it's also the first time you see it, so I don't know. Um, but yes, like uh, first of all, then you can with this property you can re reproduce the whole state space. But then the question you can have is, uh, say that I have two states and uh, they are in two different equivalence classes. How can I go from one to the other? Because so far this property hasn't said anything about that. And the way you do it is to add a bit more structure to the to the theory, and you need to add um, uh, batteries. Those are uh, additional system together with your, uh, your main one. Um, and each of the batteries store a particular kind of, uh, of resource. Uh, and uh, this, is, um, this follow from the main property that we use to define batteries, which essentially tell you that whatever transformation you perform over this global system, um, the state of the first battery will change with respect to the first monoton, but will never change with respect to the second one. It will, have, it will always stay on an like, um, orbit of fixed second monoton. Uh, and this means whatever transformation you do, you're not storing the second uh, resource on the first battery so that you can separate them. Um, and then how do you perform a transformation between rho and sigma where they are in different uh, equivalence classes? Well, you start from initial state of your battery. It's not important where you start from. Uh, the important thing is that you end up uh, with two uh, state, omega prime one and omega prime uh, two, uh, final state of a battery, such that if you compute the, mo the value of the monotone one and two over the global initial state and final one, this is the same. If this is the case, then there exists an allowed operation because of uh, the, um, the asymptotic equivalence property that will bring you from rho to sigma while transforming also the batteries. And also vice versa, actually, you can go back. And so introducing the battery gives you a possibility of quantifying the resources because you define that the amount of resource you're using during the, um, a transformation uh, is given by the change, uh, say the first uh, resource is given by the change in the first monotone between the final and initial state of, uh, of your battery. And likewise for the, the, second, uh, the second resource. And then once you define what you mean for amount, uh, the, the amount of resources exchanged, you can also say uh, how much of one resource you use in order to, from, to go from rho to sigma. And this is equal to the difference in, uh, say, the first resource is equal to the difference in the monotone computed on rho minus the monotone computed on sigma. Um, this thing is reversible because asymptotic equivalence can map you from one state to the other, but also vice versa as far as the things, the, the monotons remains uh, constant. Um, and something you can do is also to represent the amount of resources you need to perform a transformation in this diagram. Uh, you just have two points and they have this, they represent these two states. Um, and uh, the amount of resource you're using, you just project over these two lines. So during this transformation, for instance, you are extracting this amount of first resource and uh, you're paying this amount of second resource. Okay. So, ah, uh, yes, please. So always think of checking on any copies. Yes, yes, this is in an IID limit, yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so I would move now to interconversion in this first law. If meanwhile someone has a question, like, feel free to ask if something is unclear. Um, so we said 
we have now a way of quantifying uh, resources. They are stored in the battery. Now suppose that one of the battery is uh, high in one resource and uh, the other is low. Can I interconvert using some additional system? Uh, is there a way of mapping one resource into the other? Um, and in order to address this question, I first give you an example that we are probably all used to, which is whenever we go to a bank or whatever system you use in order to change uh, one currency for another one. Okay? Say that you want to, do, to go in, uh, in Canada, so you take your pound, you go to the bank, and you ask them, can you give me some Canadian dollar, please? They will take some of your, uh, of your pound and will give you some of the Canadian dollar. Um, and in this example, you can actually um, look at the bank and think, oh, what are the property that characterize this bank? And I think there are three. Um, uh, which are particularly useful because will also allow us to define what a bank is in, in, our, in, in a multi-resource theory framework. And so first of all, if I go to the bank and I don't have a um, pound and I don't have Canadian dollar, I don't have anything, uh, I cannot expect them for gi to give me something for free. Okay? I need always to trade. Um, secondly, depending on the bank I go, they fix their um, exchange rate. So if I go to Lloyds Bank, they will have a certain uh, exchange rate. If I go to Santander's, they will have a different one. Now, in reality, they don't change very much. Uh, but it depends on the bank. It depends which exchange rate you get. Um, and finally, after I perform my exchange, um, I expect that the customer uh, behind me don't get a completely different uh, exchange rate. No? So the bank act. Uh, constantly with more or less the same exchange rate. Of course, in reality, this probably changed whenever you trade with uh, a, a lot of money. Um, but for the kind of transformation like of, of exchange I personally do in the bank, uh, the exchange rate never changed. So we'll see that these property are actually the same that you ask for a bank in a multi-resource theory case. Uh, and before I go to the, that scenario, let me just give you the example um, of thermodynamics again. And in particular, Landauer erasure. So in Landauer erasure, you have, that, um, you have a bit, uh, and you are maximally ignorant about uh, its state. And, you ask, uh, and your task is to, um, with certainty, map it into the state where uh, the bit is initialized in 0. Um, so the way you do this is uh, that, yes, you have your system, but you also have ad additional resources. And uh, one of these is a battery that stores the energy uh, that you have. And the other is uh, a thermal bath that acts like a bank uh, in this scenario. So what you do is you take some energy from the battery, you put it inside the thermal bath, uh, and by inserting this, uh, uh, this energy, you are able to perform a transformation uh, that will allow you to extract some nega entropy from uh, the thermal bath while not changing the property of, uh, uh, of the bath. That's mainly because the bath is taken to be infinite dimension, uh, uh, of infinite size at least. Uh, and the exchange rate depends on the particular bath you're using. Uh, in particular, it depends on the temperature of this thermal bath um, by this, um, this equation here. Then what you do usually in, uh, in this framework is you take the negative entropy you extracted and you use it to erase the system. So that's an, exa an example of an exchange of resources. So what's a bank in a more general um, resource, multi-resource theory? Let's use the same free property I was uh, talking, bef talking before. First of all, um, I always need to exchange resources. I can never extract both resources at the same time. Uh, and you see that if you have battery and, uh, and a system, then if you are in a point in the middle here, then you can always perform a transformation that will extract both resources and put them in the battery because you, mo you can move in the southwest quadrant, going in this direction to another state, and you will have extract two resources. This means that your battery actually, uh, you, sorry, your battery, your bank, uh, the state of a bank actually needs to stay on the border of the state space and in particular on the line connecting this invariant set and this other one. Because if I'm here, then there's no way I can perform a transformation that will lower both resources and extract both of them because there's nothing here. This is not a physical state. 
Uh, secondly, depending on uh, which state I choose, say this point here, I will have a different exchange rate. Um, and this is essentially linked to the fact that for any point here, I can define a new monotone, um, which I call bank monotone, which is a linear combination of uh, the two original monotone M1 and M2. Um, and the linear coefficient of this thing are actually what define the exchange rate uh, during the interconversion of resources. And you can represent like the monotone as, as a tangent line to, the, to this thing. Finally, I ask this, uh, the bank, not the state of a bank, not to change very much during any interconversion transformation. And that's because um, I want to keep using it maybe to perform other transformation later. Um, and so if it doesn't, the property of this bank doesn't change, don't change very much, then I can keep using with the same exchange rate. And not changing very much here means uh, that the state doesn't change with respect to this monotone because it fixed the exchange rate. So if the state doesn't change with respect to this monotone, the exchange rate won't change very much. How do you do interconversion then? Um, the idea is the following. You have your bank and you have two batteries. Um, you extract one resource from one battery. You put it inside uh, your bank and you perform a transformation over your bank that won't change its state very much with respect to this uh, bank monotone, again, this linear combination of things. Um, and you will find that you will be able to extract an amount of resource, uh, the second resource, uh, during this transformation. And the two are linked by this uh, relation, which is the interconversion relation. I pay a bit of uh, first resource and I extract a bit of the second resource with an exchange rate, which is given by the linear coefficient of this, this monotone. Um, so in this way, a bank can allow you to interconvert, interconvert between resources. And from this, you can also move uh, to the case, uh, you can also move to, um, to define a first law. And the first law is exactly, um, it's exactly the same formalism. It's exactly the same situation where you have battery and bank, but you also add a main system. And you want to perform a certain transformation uh, over this system, moving from rho to sigma, and they can be in different uh, equivalence classes of states. And so whereas before, when I didn't add a bank, uh, I was able to perform this transformation only if I were to provide exactly the amount of first resource and second one. Uh, now the transformation is possible uh, if I just satisfy one single relation, this one, uh, which link the change in the property of your system with respect to uh, this monotone, the bank monotone, to the amount of resources I'm providing. If you satisfy this, then you're free to perform this transformation. What it means, say that um, you, um, you're low in the first resource, then what you can do is to use the bank to uh, exchange a bit of a second resource, put in the first one, and then perform your transformation. So that instead of having two constraints uh, during your, your transformation, it's just one, and it's this one. In thermo if you consider thermodynamics as a multi-resource theory, then you find that this relation is actually, turned out to be actually the, the uh, first law of thermodynamics. Okay. Um, I think I have five minutes or something, or? You should have, uh, uh, you actually have about six or seven minutes. Six or seven, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go through this, uh, this example, which is uh, thermodynamics as, uh, uh, with, uh, with many conserved quantity, which is, again, very similar to the scenario we were considering before of thermodynamics uh, as a multi-resource theory. Uh, in this setting, you have a, um, an isolated system, um, and you act with uh, reversible transformation. So one of the resource is, uh, is purity, if you want. Um, and then you have some conservation law. And um, uh, for instance, you need to conserve the, the charge A, or the quantity A, and the quantity B. Um, so what you do is just introduce the free resource theory you, you're interested in, the single resource theory. One is purity, allowed operation are unital maps, for instance. Uh, and the monotone you, uh, you might be interested in um, is minus the entropy. 
for the other two charge, the allowed operation are, uh, for the first one, are maps that don't increase the average value of A. Uh, and for B, are maps that don't increase the average value of B. Uh, the monotone that you have in this situation are um, average value of A, average value of B. It turned out that uh, if you take the intersection and you study this single resource theory, uh, the equivalence, um, asymptotic equivalence property holds for this uh, class of, uh, of theories so that um, you can actually build batteries, you can store the different resources uh, where you want, and you can actually perform also interconversion. And so you can ask, what are the state of a bank for um, such a theory? Uh, and it turned out that they are uh, given by states described by the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, essentially, like before, is, uh, is a Gibbs state, but this time, instead of Hamiltonian, we have uh, uh, this linear coefficient b1 and b2 that multiply the two charges we have, a and b. Uh, you can think, like, if a were the Hamiltonian, then b would be my, b beta would be my uh, inverse temperature, and if B were my number of particle, then this beta 2 were, would be the um, chemical potential. Um, you say that now you want to perform um, an exchange, then you fix um, the particular beta 1 and beta 2 you want, and they will fix the rate of conversion you, want, you, you will have. And you can construct a bank monotone, which is a linear combination of these three uh, initial monotone we had, uh, beta 1 times the average value of A, beta 2 the average value of B, and minus the entropy. Um, and now you can perform interconversion, and here is an example of, um, uh, of a specific system, is a qubit, and the two charges are A is the Pauli sigma x operator, and B is Pauli sigma z operator. Notice that they don't commute. Um, and still you're able to do interconversion and you find that the relation is, is this one. Say you can invest a bit of entropy from your bat en entropy battery um, and you can extract um, a bit of a resource, uh, sigma x resource or sigma z resource. You can also represent this all state space in a diagram. Um, now it's three dimensional uh, and uh, you find that this blue hemisphere represents the old state space. Um, here, uh, the axes are, uh, this is the uh, average value of sigma x, average value of sigma z, and entropy. The, this is a red surface, and uh, it essentially, that's the set of all possible states that can describe a bank. Then, of course, whenever you're going to do um, a interconversion, you will uh, commit to a specific bank state, and that's a point uh, like this blue point, uh, this black point here, uh, and is parameterized by a specific value of beta one and a specific value of beta two. And you can also represent the bank monotone. We give you the, the exchange rate, and this thing is uh, uh, represented with an hyperplane, in, um, which is tangent to the state space. Um, and so, like this is just a way of um, getting interconversion in uh, um, in a multi-resource theory. Okay, I think I'll conclude. Um, so what I did here was to introduce a framework uh, which is inspired uh, uh, from thermodynamics but can be applied to any uh, multi-resource theory. And uh, um, in, in order to bu build such a resource theory, what you do is to um, take as allowed operation, the intersection between the allowed operation of all the single resource theories associated with the different constraint you have. Um, you can also quantify the amount of resources you exchange whenever uh, your theory satisfies this property, this asymptotic equivalence property. Um, and in, to quantify it, you just consider the specific, mono, the specific change in the monotone uh, associated to that battery. And then once you have battery and um, uh, you have battery and a way of quantifying resources, you can ask whether you can convert things. And to do so, you need an additional system, is this bank. Um, and together with the bank, it comes an additional monotone that will fix the exchange rate. And from this, you show, we can show also that uh, if you have a system, then you just need to satisfy one single relation in order to perform a transformation, uh, which links 
the amount of resources you are giving during the transformation to the change in the system uh, with respect to the bank monocle. And so um, things that might be interesting to do uh, on, on this thing later, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I introduced this framework and I applied it to thermodynamics, um, uh, which is very interesting, but uh, the hope would be to find other resource theory uh, different from thermodynamics where uh, I, for instance, I can define a first law. We have a toy model uh, where we can exchange entanglement for energy, for example, and that might be helpful for a situation where you consider many body physics uh, where these two resources are actually important. Um, also, I said that um, if the theory satisfies asymptotic equivalence, then you can do all these things. Uh, but of course, you need to show that a, a, resource, a particular resource theory satisfies this property. Uh, it would be nice to find a general condition that tells you, oh yes, your resource theory satisfies this, or oh no, you, you cannot do this. And um, for single resource theory, conditions are known, and like in, in these two papers, for instance. And it would be nice to find them for for multi-resource theory as well. Um, then there is this thing of the batteries, like here we define them in a very easy way, it's just this property that each of them needs to, to store a particular kind of resource, but batteries have been used in, uh, in resource theory in many different ways. Okay, just to say that. Um, and um, for instance, uh, they've been used in order to study fluctuation theorem in both thermodynamics and uh, entanglement theory or coherence. So it would be nice uh, to see whether there is a relation between how people use batteries in other resource theory and uh, how we use them. Um, and yes, this is a minor point, so I think uh, I can say I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Why is it uh, that you're not referring to the bank as a type of catalyst? I think you can uh, you can refer to it as, as a catalyst. Actually, I mean, for us, uh, okay, wait. Um, we are actually changing no, 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 no. terminology. People would use it. Is it just a sort of choice uh, made to not go with standard terminology, or is it? I suspect there's some reason you No, no, good question, no. Because usually a catalyst, you need to return it uh, exactly with respect to the trace distance. Here, my bank, I don't ask you that. You actually can, I think you, like, you, I think it can be returned quite far away from where we respect to uh, trace distance, I need to check that. What I'm asking is that with respect to this specific monotone, its property, like, its value doesn't change. So it's a bit different. In fact, like I could show you how interconversion can be done in, uh, in thermodynamics, uh, where let's see, this is like the resource diagram that we had before. Um, and so let's see if I get it correct. Yes. Uh, so here you have your ground state, and and here is. Uh, um, your say this is a cubic of a wave. The cubic will be well d, cubic. Okay, your maximum mix state. Uh, everything here is um, is a state or is an equivalence class of state. Each point. Um, <coughs> on here you can find bank state. Okay, and the transformation works in this way. You start from here. You pump a bit of uh, of one of the resources, say e, so that you move uh, move here. Okay, the monotone is this one. It's not working very well. Uh, and now you need to move during the transformation, conserving this uh, this monotone here, okay, which is the, this bank monotone that just changed by an epsilon. And what can I do here? Well, I could move up here. And you see that although I'm not changing very much with respect to this monotone, I'm, I'm actually changing a lot in the amount of, uh, of entropy I gain and uh, energy I pay. So what's the quantity that's not supposed to change? Does the two, those two monotones do change? Yes, exactly. Which, Which is why you perform it. the monotone, that's supposed to not change very much? 
Which one? Pardon? Alpha M1 plus beta M2. That, that's the thing that's supposed to remain. Yeah, this line essentially. This line needs to remain uh, almost unchanged by an epsilon at least. You mean the distance from that line? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. So here you have an epsilon, and see that you are extracting here a certain amount. Okay? And the nice thing is that when you send this epsilon to zero, still these amounts are finite. So effectively the bank is a catalyst with respect to this one property. Okay? What we care about is this one property of the multi-resource monotone, and you say it has to act like a catalyst with respect to that property. To that, yes. I would say so. Yes, of course. Uh, I see what you mean. Does it seem that you want to require epsilon to be zero? You have to have exactly a perfectly flat linear surface. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, yes, of course. Epsilon is, is not zero. It's, uh, it's very small here. Um, and um, what I'm doing is that I'm considering many copies of, uh, of my bank. Um, and uh, yes, I would move. I think you're right. Essentially, yes, I'm changing slightly the, the exchange rate at the end of the day, uh, but not like, but not very much with respect to the amount of resources I'm extracting. If that makes sense. Yeah. So why do you use the word very small? Like if I look at that, and you know, say a section of a circle. Yeah. The, you know, if I do the worst case where I move from say the midpoint to the edge, I'm going to support the circle. Like I can, that, that's not very small compared to this width and this width. It's you know, ten percent. You know, like the worst case is, is, doesn't seem to be very small. But you see what I mean? Yes. essentially what you do in, um, um, in thermodynamics when you have an infinite thermal bath. Um, and uh, yeah, you perform erasure, for instance. And then it's like, you're actually asking that your thermal bath doesn't change with respect to uh, the, the free energy related to that temperature. So you will actually modify a bit um, the thermal bath with respect to trace distance, for instance, but not much for, uh, with respect to this thing. Here, I'm just questioning your use not much, very yes. small, all yes. that. It just doesn't seem to actually be very small. Very I small see. in a generic case. Yeah, I see. Uh, that unless what you're extracting, the amount of resources you're exchanging are also very small. So you say, I'm only moving a little bit along this curve. Yes. Delta yeah, no, no, no. Yes, that's the case. very small. Then in that case. That's the, that's the, OK. That's the thing. They are very small, but compared to the, the amount uh, I'm changing the thing, they are, like, if I, uh, how does it work? 
essentially get that this delta omega are proportional to the number of copies of the bank I have. Okay, so they are very small. So this is my bank, say is a thermal state, and I take n copies of them. Okay, um, what I find is that the change in the amount of resources I am uh, I'm exchanging is proportional to n to the minus one, so it's small. No, it's not like that. No, no, actually, uh, it's not like that. Is um. Yeah, no, never mind. Is uh, there's no Marcus. So uh, ju just maybe two questions to understand this diagram. Um, so could you speak up a little bit, though? Yeah. So uh, just two questions to understand this diagram a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So the points inside are somehow equivalent classes of states, mm -hmm. or actually more like systems, because you also have Hamiltonians. No, the Hamiltonian is um, is fixed. Uh, given uh, an Hamiltonian, you have a diagram. Okay. Yes. So that brings me to my second question. Um, in the mathematical physics literature, uh, when people study these models on, on the line, like spin models and so on, they draw exactly diagrams like ah, that. Cool. So um, we have the energy density on one axis and then the possible value of the entropy density on the other, I think. I see. So I wonder if that's you know, more or less the same thing or if it's related somehow. I think people will talk about the the lines that you put on the boundary and what this tells you about transition and so on. Ah, that's something I wasn't aware of actually. And uh, I would like to, like, if you have some reference uh, yeah, it's to give me. Very unfortunately, it's very typical mathematical physics literature. Yeah. I guess it's, it's related to that. Okay. Um, but are they asymptotic states in the spin model? It's here for the yeah. value. Yeah. Asymptotic, but it doesn't have to be IID or a lot of correlation. But you also get some asymptotic statement for a very large number of those sites. So yeah. you can chat about this later. Yeah, definitely. You had your hand up first yeah. and then I don't think of it now, I don't mind. So I would like to know if you if you think or like why do you think that defining the multi resource theory as a, an intersection of various mm -hmm. single resource theories is uh, is beneficial over, for example, just taking a resource theory without saying whether it's single resource or multi resource, and then requiring that the asymptotic conversions are characterized by a finite number of, of monotones. Is there any difference between those two, do you think, or uh, is it just like more conceptually clear? I, yeah, I mean, as soon as you, you mean you ask for a, one of these properties like this asymptotic equivalence to be true for different monotons and not just one? So That's what, what I'm thinking is, for example, could it be that you have a resource theory which in the asymptotic conversions are characterized by n monotons, but nevertheless it does not arise at the intersection of n single resource theories? I would be surprised if it doesn't arise to yeah, it would be interesting to know whether uh, it's possible. Like, this is the only construction uh, we could think of that was uh, consistent. Like, we could have taken union of maps, for instance, of different resources here, but they wouldn't have worked. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming it's the only one. So maybe there is a way of doing something else. You go first. So, one thing about multi-resource theories, you're looking at various Could you speak up to Oh, yeah. So when you were looking at multi-resource theories, at first you're talking about scalar charges, and you mentioned, well, you could do in general like a non-abelian charge and have non-abelian charges. So you give me, say, batteries for sigma x and sigma z. Can I then generate sigma y batteries? Or if I'm looking at a more general group structure, can I just simply generate all the commutators? If you just give me some set of group elements, I'm not creating that is a combination of those operations. So I have to say that um, I'm a bit I think I'm a bit cheating here because I really removed the difficulties of uh, non-commuting by using average uh, value, uh, like my, what is it? The operation are, uh, are this kind, it's just the average, not, uh, it's not exact. 
uh, like in, uh, in thermodynamics, you need your unitary operation for a single resource theory to commute with the Hamiltonian. And uh, if you are in that scenario, uh, then I think, meaning where the operation commute with sigma x, commute with sigma z, and blah, 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 the things get much more messy. And uh, I think no work has been done on, uh, on these things. I think recently there was a paper from the Bristol group um, on uh, like defining different batteries, but it's a difficult task. Yes. I don't know whether it's easy to separate, say, uh, resources. Wayne first, then. I'm doing it in the order in which the hands came up. Okay, this, there's a lot in here, and a lot, it went very quickly. Um, and I forget everything. Um, could you just say a little more about the application of this to ordinary thermodynamics and the, and the, and the usual first law? In particular, what, what, how am I supposed to think of as a bank? What would count as a bank system for that? Um, so I think. For me, concerning this bank uh, question, like, um, to me it was interesting to see that uh, what we think as a thermal reservoir and uh, like the kind of transformation like a Maxwell demon or an Landauer radiator is actually uh, just an interconversion of resources, uh, meaning that where the bank is your thermal reservoir. Like the example was Landauer radiator, but you can think of it as Maxwell demon in the opposite direction. You invest a bit of uh, energy entropy to get energy out of that. So it, it, I think the thermal reservoir in a, it has, has something I can use to to convert negative entropy and, and, and energy. Yes. OK. Yes. That's how we think of it. Can you speak that more about allowing operations that are, for example, energy non-increasing, like earlier in your talk? The natural thing would have been to say it just commutes with the Hamiltonian. That's but, yeah, that's possible. but instead you went with uh, doesn't increase the expectation value of the energy for any state. Yes. I mean, as well, you could say the same for the purity one. I could have asked, well, just take unitary operation. Um, instead, I took um, these unit maps. So I'm here taking just the bigger set you can think of. Yes? Because both of them are, well, I'm not sure for the second one, but for the unit maps, is like the bigger set of maps that keep the uh, maximum mixed state a fixed point. Um, and also for the resource theory of energy, I take a, a very broad one. Um, but then, of course, like the monotons that are common for this one will be monotons common also for the, the case you're thinking about unit operation that commute with the Hamilton. Is that known as a theorem? So of uh, unital operation, if you're only interested in state conversions, we, we know that there's no difference between the unital operation and the noisy operation. Yeah. That, I mean, first thing I would say is that it's much better, of course, to use the physically motivated operations. Sure. And those are the noisy operations, yeah, not the unital one. Uh, but if you're only interested in state conversion, you can say, well, that mathematically they're equivalent, so I can get away with just right. Answering the question by looking right. at the unit. So it's just a mathematical trick. It's not a change in your assumptions. But is that true for the second for case? The second is one. there a theorem that shows that state conversions I can achieve under you know, uh, Hamiltonian commuting operations are the same as what I can achieve with these things? No, I think, uh, well, that I don't know. But what I can tell you is, for instance, that um, uh, for a similar, like a resource theory, which is um, less strong than this one. Uh, so one in which you have energy preserving, unitary operation, and nothing more. Uh, then that's you mean average energy preserving, or do you mean no, exactly, exactly, exactly. You yeah. mean average energy? No, exactly. Okay, exactly. Uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, in that case, um, you know that uh, we we proved uh, with Tobias as well, and uh, that asymptotic equivalence uh, holds. So actually, it's is not needed to to use this broader class of operation. Uh, in order to say everything I said later. Uh, that's already true for energy preserving unit operation. I am talking about uh, this property here. That's satisfied if you use uh, energy preserving unit operation. Okay. With respect to average energy and uh, entropy. So for the case of the 
general charges? Why, why did you go with energy not increasing? Is there some general law that shows you allow asymptotic equivalence under those sorts of operations? Or I just use it as an example for. Uh, it's easier to talk about it. My fault. Maybe it's not. Maybe confuse people. Yeah. Uh, just can you go back to this slide you just had the two thermal expert here? Yeah. This one or the. All right. So the allowed operations and intersection would be the unit two operations that are average energy non increasing. Yes. So what's, what's the three states? I want to get this. It's not the intersection. No, there is no free state in such a state. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. There is no. There doesn't exist a state that doesn't have a bit of one resource. Uh, that doesn't have no resource for both. Okay. Think. Think of the thermal state. Like, is in, in, is this uh, is this thing here? So, uh, the maximum mixed state uh, is not a resource for purity. Yeah. Uh, but you can see that it is a resource for uh, energy, for instance. No because it does have energy with respect to the ground state. And similarly for the ground state, uh, this is a pure state, and the four will be a resource for, for purity. And, and everything here, as well, is a resource. It has a bit of one, a bit less than the other. So the three states are always intersections of the three states, because you can always see that as purely a back process of one before the other. So like three operations from nothing to something, and then also to the intersection. Okay. Yeah, yeah. More questions? Thank you.